Hello and welcome. Today we are going to take a look at the role of humidity in the airborne transmission of viruses. And, of course, with particular reference to the current COVID-19 pandemic. If we think about today's situation with COVID, it's creating a heightened sense of awareness of the impact of airborne viruses. And in particular, as education professionals, a real need for us to consider how we address this from the point of view of the school building environment. The severity and global impact of COVID-19 has seemed to catch the medical profession by surprise. However, within the field of humidification and HVAC engineering, there has been an ongoing debate as to the many benefits of healthy levels of indoor humidification with respect to virus and allergen control. This discussion has been increasingly supported by scientific research. Today, in light of this research, we will review the role of humidification to help reduce the transmission, infectivity, and severity of COVID-19 in the school environment, and briefly discuss some strategies for implementing this non-pharmaceutical approach. Our goal will be to improve the understanding of the relationship between humidity and health and wellness as well as to touch on the current standards and how to have a short and mid-term response to the virus. Currently, there are more than 147,000 schools in North America, with the majority of them being elementary schools. U.S. schools average about 500 students per school and 350 per school in Canada. While most schools are closed due to local health department guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a movement to gradually start reopening schools, maybe as early as this fall. Protections against coronavirus will be the key concern, and measures will include social distancing, hand washing, and disinfecting of surfaces. These highly effective strategies will require effort from students and staff. The addition of humidification to a school building can add one more layer of defense without any additional effort from building occupants. Why is it so critical for us to understand the role of humidification in the school building environment? Healthy levels of humidification can help to reduce the spread of respiratory viruses, including COVID-19, protecting the health of students, teachers, and staff. We know that student absences increase during the dry winter months, often due to chronic respiratory illnesses. We also know that chronic absenteeism, or missing 10% or more school days within a year for any reason, predicts low student achievement. And of course, when viruses spread among students, Teachers also tend to get ill and have to take sick days. Having to rely on substitute teachers too often can negatively affect lesson plans and is also expensive for schools. In addition, there is a real impact in terms of budgets. School budgets suffer when students don't attend. In many states, school budgets are based on the average daily attendance at a school. If many students are absent, the school has less money to pay for essential classroom needs. How can humidity levels protect us against viruses in the school setting? There are three key factors. First, persistence and dispersion. Low ambient humidity reduces droplet size, which allows for a prolonged airborne period, which in turn allows for further travel distance. The low weight due to loss of water prevents the virus from being knocked down and then cleaned up with usual surface cleaning and hygiene. Extended airborne time may be as much as 36 to 72 hours and allows for significant travel. In addition, low humidity and low droplet weight may allow viruses to become airborne after settling. Second, infectivity. Low ambient humidity with associated reduced droplet size allows for deeper penetration into the lungs, where there is a less effective biological response. This is aggravated by the low humidity conditions reducing the body's own immune response. For example, inactivated or reduced functioning of cilia, reduced mucus, etc. And finally, viral activity. Low ambient humidity levels act on the aerosol salt content, which allows for prolonged viral activity. Higher RH renders virus inactive. In addition, higher humidity levels influence the patient's own cellular recovery. We also should recognize that humidity plays a role in maintaining our immune response and the ability for us to fight off the disease. We will take a look at all of these factors as we review the current clinical research. We have curated a number of studies which you'll be able to access online for review at your own leisure. Today, we'll take a brief look at just a few of these studies. The first study that we want to touch on is the famous Sterling and Arundel study in 1986. 
they concluded that the optimum range for health, wellness, and comfort is between 40% and 60% RH. You can see the blue band. This is the optimal range for reductions in the impact and infectivity and survival of viruses. It's important to note that this is also true for bacteria as well as a number of allergens. We see the positive impact of humidity in terms of human well-being, not only in terms of the impacts of viral infections. Numerous studies have tracked the behavior of airborne viruses, and the now urgent interest is generating almost daily papers and articles. It is critical for us to understand in light of the current research how airborne viruses behave. Airborne viruses are expelled as aerosols through breathing, speaking, singing, coughing, and sneezing. We have seen examples recently of infections amongst socially distancing choirs on the West Coast. It is believed that COVID-19 behaves as an aerosol in similar ways to SARS, MERS, and H1N1, which have all been widely researched over the past 18 years. How long an aerosol remains airborne and how far it travels affects not only the spread of infection, but the severity of infection, because respiratory viruses are most harmful when inhaled deep into the lungs. Aerosols that desiccate into virus nuclei due to low ambient humidity may be traveling distances and infect patients beyond the current 6-foot or 2-meter social distancing recommendations, and are demonstrated to be more infective in low-humidity environments. Moving to the next slide, we can clearly see the potential for significant aerosol travel. In this study, the researcher was able to demonstrate pathogen-bearing droplets in aerosols can travel 25 feet or further, as shown in this capture of a sneeze and the related aerosol cloud. This is significant as the aerosol cloud will be immediately acted upon by the ambient conditions, and more specifically temperature and relative humidity. A lower ambient relative humidity will reduce aerosol particle size and weight to create virus nuclei. Droplet size impacts on infectivity, longevity, and depth of penetration. We've looked at how humidity impacts the viral aerosol in terms of its float time, but another aspect which is quite critical is its impact on the infectivity of the virus. This is a respiratory virus, and the virus in the form of droplet nuclei has the potential to penetrate deep into the respiratory tract, and in particular into the lower respiratory tract. Droplet sizes are generally below 20 microns and aerosols from 20 down to 10 microns. Below 10 microns, we have droplet nuclei that may be as small as 0.5 microns. In a low ambient RH environment, the aerosol droplet may immediately shed moisture and reduce its size and weight to become a droplet nuclei. The droplet size impacts its float time, ability to travel, and its depth of penetration into the respiratory system. In this slide, we see an illustration of aerosol size versus float time and distance traveled. As low ambient RH desiccates the aerosol, it may remain airborne for an extended period of time. Some studies have shown as much as 72 hours. From the perspective of a school building environment, we have to consider the capacity of our filtration systems to capture small particle size. We should recall with SARS that it was possible for aerosol viral particles to float not only along corridors, but also out of buildings and be pulled into the ventilation systems of adjacent buildings. Very recently, researchers at the University of Helsinki in Finland have modeled the behavior of the COVID virus. In this particular example, they modeled the behavior of the virus in a supermarket setting, which in terms of layout is quite like locker bays in similar areas of a school building. You can see that the simulated carrier on the bottom right hand side has generated a particle cloud that is drifting not only through the aisles but actually moving across the top of the shelving and infecting somebody in the next aisle. They found that smaller particles, so 5 micrometers or microns or less, were able to travel significant distances. Many of you may have seen this on the news recently. Now when we think about particle size, we've mentioned that humidity acts on the aerosol, so the aerosol is expelled in the space of about one half to one and a half seconds. We can see that aerosol particle desiccate and dry, and as it dries, it will shrink in size. In a higher ambient relative humidity environment, we would be able to see heavier virus particles settle quickly, demonstrated by the blue particles in this screenshot. This diagram illustrates the potential depth of penetration based on aerosol size, influenced by ambient RH. This is significant as it can bypass the body's defense systems, 
increasing both the chance of infection and the severity of the infection. You see in the graphic here that we can typically capture large particles between 10 to 30 microns in our nasal mucosa. We still see a capacity to fight the virus in the 10 to 20 micron size in the upper respiratory tract. The body's mucosal layer combined with cilia can clear these particles. It's important to note that low RH has been demonstrated to reduce the effectiveness of both mucosal production and cilia action. The smaller droplet nuclei can move deeper into the lung and effectively into the alveoli, where we start to see a lack of capacity or capability for our body's immune system. That's particularly important since we also know that we have no natural antibodies or immunity. As such, we need to depend on other mechanisms within the body to allow us to address or attack that virus. Research, including recent experiments conducted at Yale and published in 2019, indicates that the body's immune system is best equipped to combat respiratory infections at 40-60% to 60 RH. In addition to improving the body's immune response, higher humidity levels have been demonstrated to improve cell recovery and regeneration. In a recent study, Jennifer Ryman, PhD of the Mayo Clinic, and working in collaboration with Integrated Science Education Outreach, Inside Out, investigated how indoor humidity levels affect the transmission of respiratory viruses in a classroom setting. The study took place at the Aldrich Nursery School in Rochester, Minnesota. In this study, two classrooms were humidified with steam humidifiers donated by dry steam, while two identical classrooms were not humidified. In the humidified classrooms, the relative humidity was increased to approximately 35% RH while the control classrooms stayed at their normal level, which is about 20% RH. It was found that steam humidification resulted in a significant reduction in the total number of influenza-positive samples in the air and on surfaces, viral copies, and viral infectivity. This is really exciting data, because we see that in the humidified room, we're reducing the amount of flu that we see in the air, which is the main way that flu is transmitted and also on surfaces, the secondary route. These charts show the results of the study. Both fomites, which refer to the samples taken from the surfaces of objects like markers, blocks, and Play-Doh utensils used in the classroom, and air samples were collected from all four classrooms for analysis in the Mayo Clinic lab. The overall amount of flu-positive samples, shown as gray blocks here, was clearly reduced in the humidified classrooms. Now that we have discussed the science behind airborne viral transmission and the impact of indoor air hydration, let's talk a little bit about what the built environment experts at ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, have to say in their humidity level guidelines. Currently, ASHRAE's guidelines for schools vary between 30% to 60% RH, dependent on the usage of the space. To emphasize things, we can look to the statement from the White House on April 23rd, a clear recognition of the survival of the virus as an aerosol for more than 60 minutes at a low RH of 20% by the Department of Homeland Security. In one of the daily press briefings of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, William N. Bryan, the Acting Undersecretary for Science and Technology at the Homeland Security Department, detailed recent lab studies carried out by the agency at the U.S. Army's high-level biosecurity laboratory at Fort Detrick, Maryland. The results, which have not been peer-reviewed but were briefed to the press and on live television via slides, largely match other laboratory studies and the suspicions of some researchers by showing that the novel coronavirus, like many other viruses, does not survive as long on certain surfaces and in the air when exposed to high amounts of ultraviolet light and warm and humid conditions. Keeping indoor humidity levels at 40% to 60% RH is a safe, easy, and efficient way to reduce the spread of the virus. Not only viruses that cause COVID-19, but also, of course, other respiratory illnesses. It will not only protect the occupant's health, but as we've mentioned, may also help to reduce the severity of the infection. The addition of humidity to an indoor space can render viruses inactive and less infectious very quickly, and no effort is required from building occupants to make this happen. Humidification systems can be quickly installed on a wall and start adding moisture to rooms right away with localized control. 
larger humidification systems can be incorporated into a facility's existing HVAC system. Humidification delivers benefits beyond its defense against virus and allergens. When applied properly, it can protect the building and valuable contents as well. When it comes to protecting your investment, here are some facts that might interest you. Aurora Academic Charter School in Edmonton, Alberta, humidifies to satisfy requirements of the warranty for their gymnasium floor. Hutchinson High School in Minnesota humidifies to prevent damage to musical instruments. So many spaces in the building can benefit. Libraries, auditoriums, computer and server rooms. The benefits really start to add up and make payback on the investment much quicker and easier than you might have guessed. We would recommend that any strategy starts with a site survey. Taking relative humidity readings using a hygrometer or checking the levels via the building management system in areas of the school building will quickly determine if a facility is optimizing their defense against COVID virus. A target of 45% RH is generally recognized as providing positive benefits. If you're seeing lower RH levels, test the equipment to see if it's operating correctly. Adjust or raise set points if required. And of course, work with local agents to explore options for additional capacity or output. If you're looking at getting there quickly, commercial grade humidification equipment provides the control you need to maintain that optimal humidity level. Simple access to power, water, and drain is all you need to get a system operational. Think of any place there is a sink nearby. Local reps can help determine appropriate size and type of equipment in as little as a day. With Dry Steam's local U.S. manufacturing and expedite capacity, a solution can be rapidly implemented. Equipment can be ordered and on-site in just a few weeks, sometimes faster, and installed in a day or two. And of course, you can count on a system from Dry Steam to provide superior performance, protecting your staff and students and your investment. Dry Steam sales team will be hosting additional technically focused webinars, and most importantly, you have the expert knowledge available by contacting your local Dry Steam representative at the Find a Rep link. As mentioned, you'll see at the end of the presentation, we've placed a number of resources for you that are also available through our website. You can also find more resources on our website. Go to www.drysteam.com schools and www.drysteam.com humidification hyphen four hyphen virus hyphen reduction. Humidification is common sense science when it comes to protecting students, teachers, and staff. You can make this change immediately and easily. Thank you for joining us today.